Um, my name is Alex Lovell Troy. I'm coming to you from Los Alamos, uh, but I am not a scientist. Um, I got into HPC as a, a sysadmin because I was unsuccessful at going to grad school several times and realized that the best way I was going to contribute to science was to give better tools so that real scientists could do their jobs. Um, so today I want to talk about the kinds of tools that I helped to build, and more importantly, how building a community of open source developers around those tools is critical to the future of having, uh, having HPC continue to run the way we've done it you know, for years, where scientists are able to make the changes that they need to the tools they have uh, to tweak them in the ways that they want. So <clears throat> I don't have a lot of time. I'm going to jump right into this. We started creating this consortium of, uh, of sites that are all interested in a cloud-like HPC experience on-premise um, because we felt like there were some problems. And I think Dan yesterday summarized it very nicely as being a small tail on a large dog. What we're, more, what we're seeing more and more is that because of various things, like here, um, we are no longer the ones that dictate the way the systems get built, the way the software works. We get what is coming through the much larger $300 billion AI market. The cloud market is massive. And so if you're someone like me who wants to work on uh, on-premise stuff to make it easier for scientists to do their jobs, like the tools just aren't there. And I'll just highlight a, little, a few of these things. So first of all, there is a link here that is very difficult to see. Uh, but there was a paper that was written in 2018 um, where many of the national labs got together and they said, you know what, we don't like the way uh, HPC system management is working. And we would like to tell the vendors in an open paper what we would really, really like. And um, so I've taken a look at this paper many, many times and it dictates things like, you know, moving on from some of the XCAT based uh, system management tooling. Uh, how do we want to submit jobs? How do we want to use containers? How do we want to um, share libraries? Things like that. And we've gone back to this a few times to think, okay, well, why didn't the rest, why didn't we do this? You know, it's 2018 and it's now 2024. We've had plenty of time. Why are we still stuck? Um, part of this, I think, has to do with the fact that there is this brain drain coming out of HPC, and particularly in the on-prem system management stuff. We're, we're not the sexy area that we used to be. Um, and where that's been going is like the, the people that used to do that kind of innovation, they went off and they built the cloud, right, about 15 years ago. And since then, things haven't really changed in this part of our world. Um, that also has meant that our HPC systems have to sit totally isolated. We can't integrate them with workflows uh, easily with the rest of the tooling that we're buying, the rest of the tooling that we have out there. So we have to say, okay, well, we've got these security rules for everything that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, but then we've got these totally different security rules for those weird supercomputers that sit off in the corner. And if you ever want to connect those two, well, it's going to be bureaucratic, it's going to be slow, and it's not going to be something that can do a, a feedback loop. Um, I think part of this is also a misaligned incentives. As our industry is uh, a smaller portion of a larger industry, the incentive to fix this problem isn't one that most companies can approach profitably. And that is not to say that they're not interested in approaching it. It's that if they try to approach it in a way that allows them to have some profit, they get stuck. Because we have big dreams and we have small checkbooks comparatively. So what we decided to do was create a consortium that said, uh, we're not going to ask the vendors to do this for us alone anymore. What we're going to do is say, bring people together and create uh, this consortium, um, put a bunch of stuff out on GitHub, start talking about the problems that we've been having, and then uh, figure out how to build the next generation. And we're, we're doing this um, at openshami.org. My apology for the name. Um, OpenShami doesn't really trip off the tongue easily. It's not an easy one to explain. It's the one that, that we have chosen. It's open, composable, heterogeneous, adaptive management infrastructure. My guess is that we're going to evolve that a bit, um, but we'll keep OpenShami.org for, for you to go back to. Um, now, we're not looking to get all of the HPC stack 
into this. There's, there's lots of other programs, uh, lots of other uh, places out there that are like, we want to do a curated list of all the software you need to run a job. And we actually think that that's, that's great, but a modular approach that allows you to pick and choose the pieces you care about at the various levels is likely to be more effective if you're used to an open source world. Um, so what we look at is you have bare metal. Chances are you have a pretty good idea. You know how many, how many cabinets you've got, I hope, right? And you know what's in them, probably. And you're pretty sure what firmware was loaded on it the last time you booted it up, you think, right? So that's the state at which we start. We gotta figure out what all the things we have actually are, not what we thought they were the last time. And we need to get that to the point where we can run Slurm on top of it. Um, and I'm just using Slurm as an example here, but whatever your scheduler is, Slurm has become very common, and so it's a good shorthand. Now, we've also agreed that we're going to make a lot of the features optional and modular so that you can bring in you know, your own cloud-like authentication. So when I talk about having to put the HPC Center system in a corner, part of that is I can't get a short-lived token to do the one thing I want to do on the supercomputer. I, I get the whole thing, or I, I just get a job, and I, I have a queue. And like, but if I want to start working with Jupyter Notebooks, I can't have something that starts outside the supercomputer, does something inside the supercomputer, and then moves it on to the next, uh, all in the same Jupyter Notebook, because the, the authentication doesn't line up, the security doesn't line up. So we think we should be able to fix that, but we don't think that that's something you have to change. If you choose to use OpenShami, maybe you don't want that. Maybe you like the way it works today, but you just wish you had some of the other features. So modularity is a big piece of this. Everything, everything is opt-in. Everything is something you can choose to use or not use. Um, right now, we're working on the scaled-down version of this because we believe that uh, access matters. And we want people who have a Raspberry Pi and a couple of nodes to be able to bring this thing up. Now, I have, we haven't actually run it on a Raspberry Pi yet, but the resource consumption that we're using is equal to about that. Um, we also know that we're Los Alamos. That's not the size of cluster we use. We use much bigger clusters, and so we need to kind of target what's the biggest thing we could imagine putting on the floor. And so I just threw 60,000 nodes up there as an example. Um, we could say 100,000, we could say 50,000. I mean, we're basically saying we need to scale out to infinity, whatever that might be. Um, the modular approach that we're taking is based on the idea that if you have some containers, you can run those containers at a small scale. You can also horizontally scale out to as big as you want to go, um, and you're still going to get the same performance, the same impact. Um, so right now we're working on, <coughs> yeah, here's another link that hopefully you'll be able to click on when we send out the slides. Um, so. We've got a set of interns that come every summer down to New Mexico, which is a beautiful place to be in the summer. It's up high, it's uh, wonderful hiking. Uh, if any of you have interns that are looking for a paid internship, not this summer, we're full this summer, but next summer, um, it's great to have them. We're, we're gonna have, I think, four teams of 10 grad students. Some of them are gonna be like geology students and bio, uh, um, like English majors, things like that. Others are gonna be more computer science. We want them all to be able to build a supercomputer in the first two weeks and then use it to do something. We've got a list of like 20 projects that they can choose from. So what we've decided to do is for this scale down to manage 10 nodes from Raspberry Pi, we're gonna give this to the interns this summer. And we want all of those interns to be able to follow our directions, use our containers, get everything going to the point where they can take that and, and run with it. And we anticipate that if we give the interns the ability to break it in May, then you know around August or September, we will have fixed all of the things they showed us we broke that we didn't do right. And we'll have something that can be called like a first release. But uh, when I submitted the abstract for this talk, it was about collaborative development. And all of the things I've just done is tell you about this cool thing I'm building that I want help with. So I want to move this on to um, the development process of this. We are doing this in public on GitHub. We do have a governing board. We do have a technical steering committee. We have to make sure that each of the various um, sites are getting their, their needs met with our tooling. And some of them are more active than others, but we want everyone to come on this journey with us together. 
So what we have learned over the past year, and some of us have been doing open source for a long time, so we're, we kind of had a head start, is what I'm gonna call the collaborative development wisdom that is necessary to bring uh, an HPC group of people uh, into a project like this. And so I'm gonna go through each one of these, but complexity is opt-in. If the interns can't handle it, chances are good they're not coming back. Solve problems that matter to you because we don't have time to fully document every problem before we start trying to tackle it. So if you know what the problem is, you will be able to make good decisions about what you're changing. I don't know what your problem is, so you should help me figure it out. Uh, governance matters. This is for disagreements. How do you handle them? Um, and consensus is slow. Uh, because as we've all seen, if it's not your day job and you're not being paid for it and there's no hierarchy, committees can take a really long time to make a decision. All right, so start simple, opt into complexity. This is one of the things that, that we set up um, early on, and this is what is allowing us to start with the interns. Um, the stuff on the, on the right there, I mean left, um, is the core services, the stuff that we know you have to have to boot a, a system. And all of that is, is kind of standard. Uh, the stuff on the other side, we wanna support that, but we don't want you to be forced into it at the beginning. And so as we're making a decision about what we want to include in Open Shammy, we're always coming back to this, well, wait a second, is this something I wanna opt into, or is this something that I have, to ha I have to learn before I get started? And we're putting a whole lot more in this column than we are in that column. Um, this should be very basic. Like, this should actually feel very comfortable to you if, you if the last system you managed was a Beowulf cluster in 1997, right? It, pretty similar stuff. Um, this is the stuff that you are hearing about, that like all the AI, you know, if, you're, if you have customers that want to use your HPC systems, all your AI people are asking for this stuff. And so we got to make sure that that's perfect, and then this is something you can opt into if you want it. Solving our own problems. Um, so one of the first things that happened was we got this laundry list of all of the things um, that a, a system like this needed to do. And I called them desirements, because they're not requirements. We just desire all of them. And they're unprioritized, because it's as I think of them. And when the list is long, and you can't tell what's important, you have to push back, and you have to say, well, wait a second. But why do we do one thing before another? And the way we solved this was to turn this around and say, if you care about the problem, we want you to give us the straw man on how to solve it. And we, we move quickly. We do daily stand-ups. We throw away code when we need to. So if you get a week into development and we all hate what you're doing, we all think that you're headed down the wrong path, we've got time to fix that. But you've done so much work in describing the problem and showing an approach that if we have to burn down that straw man approach, that's an easier thing to do than to spend a month trying to scope out exactly what the features are that fit into this. And so when we ask people to solve their own problems, uh, that is what gives us the idea of what we should be prioritizing. If it's worth it to you to, to work on this. Um, what we have to have to, have this, to put this in place, we have to have a license that it permits anyone to take the code and change it in any way they see fit. We've chosen the MIT license. We have to have governance, which I'll get into more of, but that's how do we make decisions, how do we transparently report those decisions, how do you know when a decision has been made. Um, these kinds of things matter, and in an open source governance world, uh, if you don't have strong governance that people can understand, then they'll leave your, pro your project because they don't understand how to fit in. Uh, support and feedback and access, these all have to do with being in public all the time. There is nothing that we do on the LANL side or from any of other, our other partners on the project that takes place on a private repository or a private GitHub or a private anything. Um, we believe that every issue, every bug that gets, gets um, uh, put in, and every recommendation should be in our GitHub repository so that we can talk about all of it. Um, okay, and here's the governance piece. Governance is about how we agree to disagree. Um, it's very easy when everybody just is plunging along and everyone agrees, this is the next thing we should work on, this is the thing we care about, this is the thing we want. Um, how do we decide when people don't agree? And we've chosen uh, majority rather than unanimous, but that was actually a significant discussion in, in forming up the governing uh, board. 
Um, we have discussed dissent, like, yeah, I'm gonna go along with this, but honestly, I really think that other choice would have been better. And we've been using a, a format for our documents that says record all of the decisions that you make, why you made them one way versus another. And we think that this is really important when you are um, going to go back to these things a few years later, because when you find a decision that was poorly made, you have to think, put yourself in the position, well, what did they know then, and what has changed since then? Uh, because chances are nobody wants to make a bad decision. They just weren't looking at the right things at the right time. Um, I say good, re good writing is good because that's how we, I mean, we're all on GitHub. We're, we're trying to do it all in public. That means writing a lot. Good reading is actually much better, and I try to stress that with the team. Um, when we talk about, uh, when we get a, a single paragraph that describes this feature we want, right, and we have no idea what it means, it's easy to just say, eh, forget it, this person doesn't know how to specify what they want. Um, it's much better to read it and say, okay, well, they cared enough to file an issue, they cared enough to ask for, for stuff, how do we ask for more detail? What do we need to understand? How do I be a better reader of what their intent was rather than, than just discard it? Um, this is also true when you get very, very long documents. Um, like here is a 20 page you know, description of why you should use this novel crypto system. Like, well, no, but let's, let's kind of shrink that down to something that, that we can work with. And reading it to shrink it down and summarize it is a, is a good thing. Um, good fences make good neighbors. One of the things that allows us to have multiple organizations working in the same sandbox is that I can very clearly say, my API stops here, the contract across this API boundary must look like this, and you must do your part to adhere to that. And we can put conformance tests around that. That boundary means that we don't have to talk every day because I, I, I can clearly develop up to mine and you can develop up to yours. Uh, thankfully, we've got a ton of standards bodies that have been putting together standards for years and years and years that we can rely on. And so we've been doing a lot of that, wherever possible, open API, wherever possible, something from OCP or DMTF or IETF has the standard in it, and we just say, you know, let's implement. It also means that when we have a problem, we can say, well, does this conform to the IETF standard on uh, logging that we have chosen, because there are multiple, right? And if not, what's the difference and how do I send somebody to the IETF to, to learn more rather than having to spend time with every single uh, um, update to say here's where we, we need you to go differently. And finally, um, consensus is slow. I like to move, I like to move fast, right? I uh, spend most of my career in cloud and so in the cloud industry we, we, we do tend to move a bit faster than in scientific computing and it can be a little frustrating to me to have someone say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, and then two weeks later come back with a very well-reasoned, well-written uh, critique of the idea because it just took them a while to think about it more. Because now I've, I've already done two weeks of development. But what we've learned with this tool, or with, as we've been putting this together, is um, that we need to give people the time to adjust to new ideas, we need to give the people time to come to consensus, we can't force it, um, because as we get better at collaborating, those cycle times get shorter, um, but if you force somebody to move to before they're, they're ready, uh, it can be a very, very scary thing. All right, so this is, uh, this is the plug. Um, we are looking for help. Um, we are looking for other people that are interested in this. Like, with XCAT going away, or sort of not going away, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of opportunity here for us to decide what the next generation of HPC system management should look like, and I want as many people involved in that conversation as possible. Um, if you want to come to Annapolis in about a month and join us, that'd be great. Um, but if you just want to go to the website and say, Here, here's something that I think would matter to me, we would really, really appreciate that. Uh, okay, so I think I have five minutes left, um, and yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. 
I'll kick off with a question. So I haven't been to openshami.org yet, but I'm assuming you guys have maybe some tutorials, training, or anything like that. Speak to us about that. Sure, you'll find a lot of that stuff in our GitHub. Um, the main repository for that at the moment is our is a de a deployment recipe repository, and it allows us to, to stand up one of these systems in very little time, like seconds to minutes, uh, based on your, your ability to pull Docker containers. Okay, thank you, that's good to know. Uh, once the Supercomputer Institute is complete, we'll have full intern level documentation, which will also what, be that's good. That's what I need. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes and no. Um, so we, everyone who is part of the foundation of the consortium has kind of signed on to providing resources. And some of that is funding and some of that is people. Uh, some of that's direct funding and some of that's people. Um, we also have contributors that are not currently being compensated. Um, they're doing it because this is something that is useful to them. And one of the things we've heard is that this allows HPC sysadmins to become an expert in something rather than wait for the next system to come along and totally change what they're doing. And that's enough of a motivation to get involved. Coming to you, Raj. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, this looks like a very good project. Uh, are you planning to extend not just a provisioning engine, but beyond that, like a configuration engine as well? Like a post install script in the uh, XCAT and taking it beyond to like an Ansible oh. or Puppet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the choices that we've made, uh, and I couldn't go through everything on here, is that we prefer CloudInit as a push method uh, for post boot uh, node customization. And we're trying not to use push based Ansible, some, something like that, um, wherever possible. Our longer term goal is to actually get to the point where we could load a, uh, when, the, when the hardware is all ready for this, right, we could load an encrypted VM and whoever is running the HPC system wouldn't have access to the workloads. And so we're trying to favor out of band management for everything and providing tools like CloudInit that allow people to say, well, give me enough information so that the encrypted VM can then make a decision what to do next. So that's the model we're looking at. But if, if folks think, ooh, that's a terrible model, right, come tell me about it. One right here. There was an effort that I thought was called Open HPC, maybe, um, that was supposed to work on standardizing the software stack for sort of HPC Linux clusters. Is, are you guys related, connected to them in any way? Um, yes and no. I mean, so we are, we are connected to them, but we're not uh, part of it. Um, Open HPC is, tries to be full stack a curated set of software, you know, soup to nuts. And if you like all of the pieces except one, OpenHPC is really hard to pull out that one piece you don't like. And so we're starting from a modular place. Now, if you wanted to use OpenHPC for your system images, for instance, and OpenShami for your hardware management, like there's nothing to stop you from doing that. And in fact, we would really like to see something like that happen. Okay, question here. Hey, Alex, thanks for the talk. Um, I noticed HPE's name on your list of collaborators. How about all of the other vendors? Like, where are the vendors in terms of supporting this from, like, from, the, from the bottom up, right? Yeah, so we've talked to other vendors. There was only, so the, the, the members are the people who have made a commitment to uh, some level of resourcing. Um, we don't have those sorts of commitments from other places, but there are other uh, sites and there are other vendors that are interested in participating. Um, they just haven't figured exactly how and where yet. So I don't think having HPE means they're gonna be the only vendor that does this. Um, but I don't think that we've yet figured out like, you know, where do each of the other vendors fit in? I don't wanna name them yet, but you know, they can make their own decision, but they know that we would love to have them and we think it'd be great for them. All right. Last call. Okay, let's get a round of applause for Alex. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.